she's a she was my the poor person who got stuck before I put on the waiting room. Alien so, <laughs> for understanding if you can hear me. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I would like to uh, briefly introduce our guest speaker, um, Megan Shelby. Megan graduated from Fairfield University in 2010, went on to receive her master's in education at Boston College and teaching licenses in early childhood and elementary education in Massachusetts. She spent a decade teaching at public and private elementary schools in, Bo in Boston suburbs. In the fall of 2019, she took a brief hiatus from teaching to refocus her energy and align her skills to serve others. While fundraising and running her second marathon for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, she realized that there is an opportunity to impact the world beyond the four walls of the classroom. And COVID brought into focus the realization that there is a need for teaching children one-on-one, -on -one, so Megan founded Next Step Education, offering private tutoring, preschool grade six supplementing, and supporting students in person and online. Megan uses her passion for working with children to build confidence and momentum for every day. So Megan's gonna to speak to all of you tonight and share her wisdom and expertise. And she is going to answer questions that were submitted online during registration. But if you have additional questions, please feel free to pop those in the chat. And I will turn it over to you, Meg, for it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really excited to be able to share my work with all of you. And I hope that it can be helpful. So I will just start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated from Fairfield in 2010. I was a journalism major um, and a marketing minor. And during my time, I was really involved kind of across campus, which was awesome because I feel like I got that full Jesuit experience. Um, I did retreats. I was Eucharistic minister. Um, I went on service trips and I joined the mirror. So I was an editor there um, and I was an RA. So I really got to kind of dip my toes in a lot of different areas. And I think a lot of those skills kind of carried over um, and kind of helped me find my way after graduation. Um, but when I graduated, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, I Working for a newspaper was something I really thought I wanted, but back in 2010, it was kind of when things were shifting. Um, sort of the social media, digital media world hadn't quite kicked off where it is today, and I didn't really know what I wanted. So um, after meeting with an old high school teacher who kind of helped guide me, he sort of pulled that out of me, you know, teaching is something that you really love and kids is something you really love. Maybe going back to school is something that's right. So I did, I went back to school to become a teacher. Um, I went to BC and I got my master's in early childhood. So during my time, I taught in Newton and Wellesley um, in the early childhood grades, um, K1 and 2. And then I spent my last year of teaching at St. Agnes um, in Arlington. So when I was there, I taught second grade, which I loved. Um, it was Teaching First Communion was a big part of it also, which um, I know there was a question about COVID and religious ed, so I'm gonna hit on that at the end. But um, I really loved being able to kind of use my religious background and a lot of my experiences from Fairfield to kind of reach those kids, which was something um, to be able to combine like my Catholic faith with education. It was such a perfect culmination of those two. Um, but during that last year, I kind of felt like, you know, this is teaching, this is kids, this is everything I love. But inside, I just felt like there was something more that I wanted to do. So I kind of hit pause, which was something I hadn't done in 10 years of teaching. And I took a step back um, to kind of see, was there like another way I could use my skills and my love of teaching and of kids to help support them? And, um, you know, was there another way that I could do this? So this was the fall of 2019. I had no idea what was in store, but um, I took some time off um, and I got back into running. So I, um, ran for a couple different charities. And during this time, it kind of helped me gain clarity on how, you know, I could do this work and how I could create impact just outside of the walls of the classroom. Um, so it kind of gave me confidence in my path and sort of trust um, in my ability to sort of strive for more. So it brought me back to this question of how can I best use my gifts and my talents to serve others, um, which kind of was a foundation that had been instilled in me with all of the um, Jesuit ideals during my time at Fairfield, sort of that um, ability to reflect on where I was and where I wanted to go. Um, so then 2020 hit um, during my hiatus from teaching. And at the time I was nannying for a family that had six kids. Um, four of them were in school and there was just this huge need for support. The kids needed support and the parents needed support. And um, 
I kind of just realized, you know, maybe this is the opportunity. Maybe this was my reason for kind of taking that break. You know, this is my time to use my skills um, in what I'm passionate about to, to serve others. Um, so I founded Next Step Education last summer. And um, I've been just supporting and helping children one-on-one -on -one with grade level curriculum to sort of fill in the holes and the gaps in the learning and just make it fun and engaging for them. So I work with children preschool through sixth grade um, based on this philosophy of confidence and momentum and growth. So kind of starting with that place of confidence and helping children feel you know, capable and able of doing the work and that just sort of builds to momentum and ultimately um, leads to their growth across the curriculum. So tonight I hope to offer you strategies to help motivate your child and resources to build that confidence um, and just some tips for home setup and routines to help foster a love of learning. So here are some strategies. It may seem like a funny place to start with handwriting, but this is something that I really value. Um, and it's something I work on with all of the children that I see. Um, this is just an example of some number writing that we did. And um, I really think that the importance of consistency and consistent practice, even if it's only um, just five minutes a day. You know, when I first get there, whether it's number writing or letter writing, just spending five minutes to practice. Um, this was just the difference between October and November. So just having that, um, that time and that opportunity to practice really, um, as you can see, really added up. And here's another example. Um, some of the boys I work with, we do it with number writing also. So um, here's something that I did where I modeled the numbers. Um, it's really important to model for them so that they can see and not just have blind expectations. So we, I modeled for them and then they practiced writing it um, and just giving them that opportunity. Again, five minutes of consistent practice really does add up over time. Um, Word building is something that we work on a lot, and this is a real big foundational skill in kindergarten and first grade, but also going through elementary school. Um, using these magnetic letters is just something novel to have around the home. Sometimes having things that children have at school, having them at home just makes it exciting and engaging. They can sort of have their, their own way to practice that they don't have to share with classmates and they can kind of use tools that they have in the classroom. I found to be really uh, motivating for a lot of my students. And this is a great way to practice sight words or spelling words. Um, so this was just magnetic letters on just a cookie sheet that we had. So she had a lot of fun with that. Um, ordering numbers and um, just that skill of whether it's um, writing the numbers and then putting them in order. This was again um, with a kindergartner. So we were working on numbers one through 10. You can do it with one through 20. Um, I try and make it seasonal. So here we had um, just hearts and it was just you know manipulatives that she could move around to put the numbers in order, um, just building that skill. So it was number writing. And then it was also <clears throat> that skill of ordering numbers, which is, you know, it seems so simple, but that repetitive practice is something that children really need. And to have something hands-on that they can, you know, touch and move around and manipulate really helps the learning to sink in. Um, posters are a really awesome way that you can engage your child at home. It really makes the learning personal and this is something that's been very successful with students I've worked with. Um, this child was getting a glowfish so she was so excited about it and as far as I know glowfish are not on any science curriculum in school but it was something that, you know, we took the time to make a poster about and she drew a picture of, you know, the fish tank she had all set up we added labels, we created a glossary down here. She wrote some fun facts. And just again, having something novel, like a big, huge poster board and allowing them to kind of express themselves and dive into something that's important to them is a really great way to kind of, you know, add that curiosity and that motivation that, oh, this can be something, this can be a way that I can learn. And it's not just a pencil and a piece of paper, but it's, you know, a fun way that I can use, you know, markers and crayons and write really big and finally use bubble letters um, in just a fun opportunity. And here was another one um, where we talked about the solar system. So we read a couple books and then we made another big, huge poster of the solar system. And the benefit of this is that it's allowing them to practice those drawing skills. Um, <clears throat> and it's novel having those big poster boards and also nonfiction exploration. Kids are, I found, so curious about the world around them. And those nonfiction books are often the ones that they gravitate towards in the classroom because it's really, you know, learning about snakes or bugs or volcanoes. 
Um, those are always really popular. So having those around your home for kids to dive into, that can kind of light that curiosity and they'll want to pick up a book maybe about something that's one of their passions or their hobbies or their interests. Um, and it might not be everything, but if there's one particular area that they're interested in, you know, filling that, filling that need and coming up with creative ways like posters to kind of give them the opportunity to engage. Um, something that I've worked on with a lot of students is drawing and using these step-by-step -step drawing. Um, I found a lot that children hesitate to write, especially in the K to two age, they'll hesitate to write and they'll only wanna write about things that they know they can draw because in those early grades, they know that they're often gonna be expected to have to provide a drawing for whatever it is that they're writing about. Um, so having something like this, practicing, um, there's lots of books for step-by-step -step drawing or um, I know my nephew loves the online YouTube videos for the step-by-step -step drawing and just giving them the opportunity to practice and to kind of build that confidence in themselves that there are you know, that they are capable of drawing. And so when they have that, then they'll feel more capable of wanting to write more. I have one student who we do like a weekend journal type activity. And every Monday I show up and he writes, I played basketball, I played basketball, I played basketball. And when I try and ask him to write about something else, he often like hesitates. And he's like, I don't remember what else I did. I don't, I don't know, I, I played basketball because I know for him drawing is a skill that's really difficult. And so he only wants to draw basketball because that's something that he's practiced. So whether it's, you know, a how-to drawing type book or just having, you know, opportunities for your children to practice, I think that in addition to the writing, the drawing is a big, huge piece of that and modeling it. I know I do that with my, um, my nephew a lot where if he's not willing to dive in and try something, if I do it and he sees me modeling it and practicing it, then he's more likely to want to participate and to feel confident trying, trying that skill on his own. Um, creating games and involving your child in feeling like that sense of ownership is really empowering for them. So this was an example. Um, this was with a kindergartner and we were working on number skills um, greater than and less than. And rather than just showing up with a game, which sometimes I do just bring a game, but in this instance, I asked her to help me make it. So I made all the green number cards and she made all the pink number cards. And then, you know, it was basically like we flipped over a card and saw whose was bigger and whose was smaller. But she was far more engaged because she had been a part of making that game. So here's another example of bingo. I showed up with sight word bingo and it wasn't as engaging. She was kind of hesitant to want to play. And then, you know, why play a game out of the box when you can build your own? This child was so excited to, you know, make her own version of bingo and make her own cards. And that was something that she was really excited to um, participate in. She wanted to make four boards so her whole family could play and they would each have their own after dinner. Um, so, you know, finding opportunities for your child to feel like an active participant in the learning um, is something that I found to be really successful. This is an example of something I did with a fifth grader. She um, was pretty much a reluctant reader and she didn't have a lot of confidence in her reading. She, she felt sort of behind, like her classmates were always reading bigger, longer books than her. And reading was really something that didn't come naturally to her. So I had been working with her for a while. And one day I realized, I was like, you know, I bet if we sat down and we wrote down, you know, how many pages she's actually read and we added up, you know, it might help build that confidence in her. So we did. And I don't remember if it was this day or another day, but we found out that her total page count was a thousand. And she, the look in her eyes that she had read a thousand pages was just like, so exciting to her and she was so proud and she hung it up on the fridge and her grandfather you know she told me he saw it and he was so proud of her and so just finding little ways that might seem really simple but to kind of like acknowledge the work or keep track of you know something that's challenging for them that they've been able to accomplish and again it comes back to that Jesuit ideal of reflection and you know stopping and acknowledging the work that's why a lot of the times children keep portfolios that they bring home you know at the end of the year of their work throughout the year. And it kind of gives you the opportunity to stop and to reflect on all of the hard work. And just even acknowledging that and you know, saying like, you've been working really hard or look how many pages you've read, that, that look in their eye when they realize like you're acknowledging that and you're proud of them and then they feel proud and confident in themselves is something that's been really exciting. And this was you know, just such an example of that for one of my students. 
Um, having a collection of just right books at home is really key to helping your child learn to read. A lot of times um, picture books don't follow, like story books don't follow a repetitive text or they have words in there that are very challenging for children. So just any old picture book off the shelf might be hard for them to sit down and read. Um, these are some of the scholastic readers that I have here and they've been really successful with some of my younger children. You can get them on Amazon. Um, but they just have like small repetitive text and it's predictable and it's words that children know. And so, you know, if you have a collection of those books that they know they can read that you can put in a basket or a bin um, or some of those books, sometimes the paper ones they'll come home with from school, saving those because those are gonna help to build that confidence, which is gonna you know, build that momentum and eventually lead to their growth. Um, this was something, again, he was a very reluctant reader, but we worked through these books and when he felt like confident, these were books he could read. You know, It was one of those moments that he was like, wow, I have a whole box of books. I, as a reluctant second grader, know that I can read. So when I have to read for 10 minutes or 20 minutes at night, I know I can go to this box and feel like I could pull out any book and be confident. And um, so here's just one little quick tip if your child, again, this is more for like the K to two, K to three range, just a little five finger test that I like to do with some of my kids where you open up a book and you read just any random page. And if it's, you know, you put up a finger for each word that you can't read on the page. And so if it's, you know, just one word, the book is probably, you know, too easy. Two to three words that are challenging is where the book is gonna be just right. And if there's four or five or more words on the page that the child can't read, then it's probably at like more of a frustrating level for them. So that's just kind of a little tip if you're, you know, looking for books like these biscuit books are good or um, I have so many I could share, but just that five finger rule is just a good tip to remember when your um, child who's learning to read is looking for just right books to have at home to practice. Um, again, that's just a picture of the inside of those books. Um, time and money is a really big skill in first and second grade. So any resources that you have at home to practice, whether it's, you know, having clocks around your house that you're pointing out. This was something we did where they made their own pocket watch and it was really good practice writing the numbers, noticing the numbers on a clock, noticing the order they go in. Again, it might seem so simple, but this is a skill that really they go into in first and second grade. So having that foundational knowledge of, you know, what does a clock look like? What numbers are on the clock? You know, what do the different hands on the clock mean? Um, this child got really excited and he drew a little picture. He just gotten a puppy. So he put that on there and it was just, you know, it made the learning come to life for him. And it wasn't just, you know, a worksheet with a clock on it and numbers, but it was like, you know, he had his own clock that he could move the hands around and he could practice telling time. And it just made it more hands-on and interactive for him. Um, going into the summer, having some sort of journal or um, routine for practicing writing is really important. And I like to do this weekend news. So it really just, you know, on a Monday morning or on a Sunday, just one page a week as an opportunity to practice. You know, what was one thing we did this weekend that we could write about? Um, sometimes that's enough. And if you do that and you know, you know, eight or 10 weeks, there's going to be eight or 10 pages of this like that, that counts and that's significant. And that's a good opportunity to practice the writing and the drawing and just kind of, you know, stopping and reflecting on what they've been doing. It gives writing a purpose and it helps build a routine and children just thrive on routines. And I think it makes the writing skills build and become a little bit more automatic and natural when it's something, you know, they're, they know they're gonna have that expectation that every week they're gonna be doing this. So I know when I was teaching, kids would come in all excited to share their weekend news, you know, because they knew they were gonna be writing about it. So they would have something ready. Um, so that's just one recommendation for the summer or even starting now just to have extra writing practice, just a simple, you know, one or two sentences, you know, what was your weekend news? What can you write about and draw a picture? Um, this is an example of a sight word game. Your children, whether it's, you know, they come home with a spelling list and they need to practice those words. This was just kind of a little hide and seek game we did where we wrote the words on clothespins and then on a piece of paper. And then I hid kind of the clothespins around and they had to go find them and then match them up. So that was just a quick way to practice. They're seeing the word, they're writing the word, they're matching it up. And that was just a way to kind of make those spelling lists in that um, traditional method of just sitting there and writing down the word over and over again to practice. This just kind of makes it a little more hands-on and engaging.
this was another example of a sight word game. Um, it was just memory. So we made two sets of every word and we flipped them over and then just took turns matching them up. So again, it's not that worksheet model that maybe <laughs> some of us I know I grew up with in Catholic school, but this kind of makes it a little bit more engaging and the learning more fun. Um, I referenced nonfiction books earlier, but if you don't have any or if you don't have many, I highly recommend getting some for your bookshelves. This is the stuff that would the kids would gravitate towards when we had free reading because it was, you know, that real world application of things they were into. Um, these National Geographic kids readers are something that I love. You know, they have great pictures and illustrations and, and captions and kids just love, you know, learning about snakes or bugs or sharks or volcanoes. Um, so I highly recommend getting some nonfiction books if your, you know, collection at home is mostly of storybooks. Um, and here's just one example of, you know, having visuals to practice. This was, you know, rather than just straight practicing her multiplication facts, we made these little multiplication fact posters. So these were all the multiples of three on a three. And then, you know, she had that up on the wall as a visual representation. Um, and then just during your like nightly reading routines, stopping and asking questions and asking your children, you know, what does this story remind you? you of or who are the characters in the story just simple things like that to engage them and show you know your curiosity for learning will help inspire their curiosity for learning um, so now i just want to share a few resources that i love to use that you can get to have at home if you would um, like if you think they'd be helpful for your child these dry erase boards i love again i talked about the practice practicing handwriting and these books are pretty awesome. They're dry erase and they have all the letters in the alphabet. So if you had something like this, just, you know, each day picking one letter and just having your child sit down and practice just one letter, even if they're in like third grade and they can of course write their letters, this gives them a good model for that practice. And again, that's just gonna help with, you know, consistency. Having math tools around the house for exploring, um, having dice or having these cubes or having rulers, you know, anything that they're learning about that they can kind of explore and play with on their own. These Unifix cubes, they're those little plastic cubes that link together, kind of like Legos, but they're something they have in school. And then when they have them at home, kids get really excited that they get to play with them on their own. I know with these kids love, you know, connecting them together and having them stretch across the whole room or building different patterns with them. Again, these are skills that they're learning patterns and measuring. And so when they just, you know, have that free explore at home, it helps build that curiosity and that momentum for wanting to learn. Um, I could go on forever talking about some of my favorite book series, but, um, you know, just making sure that you have a collection of different books at home and having, you know, some early readers, having some nonfiction books. And then if your child likes a certain book, you know, having a whole series or if that author has other books, getting other books by that same author. That can help build momentum and that can help build curiosity because they know if they like one, then they might like another. If they know they can read one, then they'll be willing to try another. Um, a lot of these series books are just ones that have been really popular with kids I've worked with. Um, and then for home setup and routines, just having things, I'm sure at this point after a year of most children being home, you have sort of a routine, but just having things easily accessible whether you have an alphabet chart or if you have a number line, um, just having things out and easy for them to, to reach, always having like sharpened pencils around. Um, and then on the next slide, I'm gonna show a word wall that I built with one of my students. So having those, you know, sight words like because and does and gave and you and those words they're frequently using, having them up on the wall so that they're learning to practice them. And whether it's their spelling words, you know, it's not just seeing them in a book, but if they're always up there, maybe the, his um, area is set up kind of off the dining room. So, you know, when he's eating dinner or when he's walking through the room, maybe he's glancing up and seeing a word. And it's just that visual reinforcement is really, has been really helpful and successful for him. Um, these are just some other ideas for how to practice literacy at home in a more engaging and fun way. Um, letter writing is an awesome way to practice, you know, handwriting, also putting your ideas down in paper, um, posters I talked about in the beginning, picking things that your child's interested in and providing them, you know, a fun opportunity to practice diving into it in a new way. 
um, or book writing. Sometimes those are the things that children a year or two later will look back on, you know, a book they wrote about their trip to wherever they went or a book they wrote about dolphins that they decided to research. Um, sometimes even having the parents type up the words makes it exciting because it's typed <laughs> and then the children can illustrate the pictures. Um, or maybe it's a great opportunity to have your child practice typing. Um, or they can just handwrite a book, you know, and staple it together. I know in kindergarten, a lot of my children love to do that, just writing their own books. And, you know, it was exciting to be able to staple the pages together and, you know, how long could they make it and making a cover page. And then it was, again, something they were proud of and something that, you know, built that motivation and that curiosity. Um, having a diverse home library, not just fiction and nonfiction, but magazines are a great thing. Um, there's lots of awesome subscriptions, those spider magazines or um, I think click magazines. Um, there's a bunch of different resources of kids magazines, which is just, you know, another way that they can get into reading, into learning. Um, that's not just a book out of the library or a book from Amazon if they're, you know, reluctant to pick up books. Talking with, with your child, that alone helps increase vocabulary so much. Um, you know, storytelling or going for a walk and talking about the different things you see, using those words and like full complete sentences and modeling that good vocabulary is just so significant in impacting their positive vocabulary development. Um, and then things like cooking, you know, measuring, that's math, reading directions and step-by-step -step problem solving. Um, those executive functioning skills, something like cooking is a great way to practice that. And then having some sort of calendar in your home gives them real world, you know, application of days of the week and numbers, number order, writing, you know, special occasions down. And it just shows that numbers have meaning beyond just, you know, math curriculum in school. It shows, you know, numbers on a calendar stand for significant dates and the order they come in. Um, and then games. Games are an awesome way to just, you know, build skills like turn taking and problem solving combinations of numbers. It also helps build patience and just talking increases that vocabulary and those communication skills. So there are so many games out there. I could give so many recommendations. These are just a few. Um, but again, it's not just like a win-lose game. There's so much more to it, like these, um, these skills that I have listed here. And then just reading every day is so important. And it doesn't have to be, you know, 20 minutes in one block of time, even if it's some in the morning and some at night. But this is a visual I really, I think is so significant to look at. If your child is reading less than a minute a day versus 20 minutes a day, just what that can do for their vocabulary development. And in this next slide, you know, if they're reading less than a minute a day, over the course of a year, they're exposed to about 8,000 words. And then if they're reading, you know, four and a half minutes a day, 282,000, if they're doing that full, you know, recommended 20 minutes a day of reading, their vocabulary, the words they're exposed to a year, 1.8 million, like just to look at the significance of that compared to, you know, if they're reading a minute a day at 8,000 words. I think this visual always, you know, helps me just remember how important it can be to just find those opportunities to be able to sit down and build a reading routine is just the number one most impactful statistic I've read about for having children having, you know, successful academic experience is that um, 20 minutes a day of reading. And just remembering that picture books are not just for older kids. Um, there's so many skills that are linked to just reading in general and picture books provide, you know, an opportunity for a stronger vocabulary, enjoyment, it increases their attention span and their cognition, and it provides, you know, a safe way to explore, you know, emotions or topics um, and just promotes bonding through that shared reading experience. So just keep it simple, follow your child's interests and just find ways to see the joy in learning. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And these are just, you know, what I'm up to tutoring one-on-one. -on -one. And um, I do have a reading comprehension course I'm happy to share. I'm also all over Instagram and Facebook um, almost every day offering just tools and support. And then I just wanted to end, this is just a quote I really love. Um, I am a pencil in the hand of God and it just seemed, you know, we all have these skills and there's different ways that we can use them and then really just honing in and finding the way that, you know, you can use your skills most to um, impact your child and, you know, how can you use your skills and your abilities to, to help their learning and to help them grow. 
So um, that's it for that. And then I do have some questions that were um, submitted already that I would love to just dive, dive into. So one that was asked was about COVID and religious education. Um, and I really love that because that's something that I miss um, from teaching at St. Agnes was being able to teach the religious ed piece. So these are just some things that we used in my classroom that were really um, impactful. The, you know, there's so many different children's Bibles, but um, I have a link that I'm going to send out with some resources. And one is a interactive Bible we had in my classroom. Also just songs. Kids in my class love to sing, you know, songs from church and, you know, when they're going to mass weekly, um, they're hearing that music and a lot of my kids love that. So, you know, bringing that into the home if you're not going to church or if they're not having those religious ed experiences, I think music is so important. There's also so many crafts and also my kids love learning about the saints and the lives of the saints. Um, that's a great way to kind of, you know, build that religious ed at home and, and makes it sort of real. And then um, form.org is a great resource a lot of parishes have subscriptions to. Um, and there's a lot of videos, there's kids videos that we used to watch about the lives of saints or different holidays or um, different themes that might be engaging to children around religion. Um, another question that came in was how can we get the schools to do their part um, and assist with the transition to in-person learning? So I think just some ideas that I had were asking for clear expectations and just having you know clear open communication with teachers, um, asking teachers, I asked one of my students today kind of what he thought. And he said, you know, asking the teachers to have um, outside time or extra breaks for that socializing. A lot of these kids, um, as you know, who have probably been home, they've been missing that socialization. So now that they are going back to school, you know, asking what the plan is for opportunities to be able to socialize um, together. How would you engage an ADHD 13 year old boy um, some ideas that I have that have been successful with similar students I've had are having headphones. So when they're doing their work at home, rather than just having the volume coming out of the computer or the iPad, having headphones has been really helpful to keep him focused. Um, flexible seating, there's, um, lots of different chairs and those ball chairs or those wobble chairs, having a band that goes around the bottom of the chair is something that's been, um, helpful for one of my students and having sort of those fidget toys. Um, he said, you know, repeating hand motions, but those ones that they can hold in just one hand has been helpful to help him focus. And how to ensure children are not being distracted by non-school work when online. Um, have it making sure, you know, setting the expectation that there's gonna be one tab open on their screen. And I think checking in and following up, showing them that you're curious what they're learning about and kind of holding them accountable. If they know, you know, they're gonna be sharing what they're learning, then they'll be more likely to want to, to, to listen and to have that accountability. Um, and also having a checklist, you know, what is it that you do when you sit down to your class? You're supposed to sit down and you're supposed to log in and you know, what are these things that are expected and just having a visual checklist. I know that's something I've done with my students on the desk has been something that's helped um, to stay on task. So that is it for me. I hope this was helpful. And if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Meg, we do have a couple um, questions here. Okay. Um, I will read them to you. They came in to me. Um, okay. What are some quick, fun things I can do over the summer break to help keep my child engaged or prepared for the new year? I know you touched on a lot of resources, but are there, I guess are there certain things you would highlight? Yeah, I think um, to keep things fun, like in the summer, I think even things like sidewalk chalk and using that to, you know, write, write different words or to practice writing on the driveway, things like that can be really fun. Um, again, you know, some sort of journal where they're writing in it or even just drop the writing and have them just draw pictures just to kind of, you know, have that practice um, and kind of build in that routine. Um, other things that are fun for the summer. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think, I'm blanking, <laughs> but um, just like games, like any games you have, I think building in that routine, um, you know, because it's, it's building those other skills, it's building in, um, you know, those problem solving skills and those communication skills, and that is the important stuff. You know, school is not just all academic, I think a lot of it is social too, so providing them those opportunities to practice those other non-academic skills is really important. Great, I have two more. 
Thank, thank you for that. Um, kindergarten is such a fundamental building year with a non-traditional year. This past year, are there certain things I should reinforce at home to ease the transition into first grade? I have such a special place in my heart for kindergarten. I could talk to you all night <laughs> about it. Um, I think it's really like making sure your kid loves school. Like that's what's going to be what carries them and making sure that they, you know, are, are interested and curious. I think in kindergarten, really the foundational skills with math, it's like the numbers, the number writing, you know, writing numbers one to 20. Um, I mean, you, you can Google your state standards just to know like technically what they need to know, but I think having that love of learning, practicing those handwriting skills, um, and then just, you know, those beginning reading skills, you know, talking about books with your kids and giving them opportunities to, you know, build those comprehension skills is really important and the rest, the rest will come. I really do think that it will shake out. I know it's so scary because kindergarten is so foundational, but um, everything builds. And I think that a lot of these, you know, potential holes will be filled in if there's that, um, that curiosity and that love of learning is really gonna be what's gonna carry them. Great, last one. As of now, if anybody has anything else, feel free to pop it in the chat. So this one is a little bit different from the academic side. After a year or even longer at home, do you have any tips or advice or resources that you could share to help ease the emotional side of entering a new grade next year, perhaps with students they have never met in person? Yeah, it's, it's definitely been such a different year. And again, like the academics are important, but the socializing is so, so significant. I know um, one of the students I work with, she has like a weekly Zoom call with some of her friends, I think on Friday afternoons, just to kind of have that, you know, socializing experience. Um, I think they started, another student I work with started like a, an online newspaper where they're all kind of collaborating and talking through that. Just, I mean, depending on people's comfort level and who's getting together or play dates, I don't really know kind of what people are doing for those opportunities. But, you know, now they do have these technological skills and they, you know, are able to, you know, have a Zoom call with friends or um, I know that there are, you know, like out school. I don't know if you've heard of that platform, but they offer um, online courses. So maybe, you know, having, having your child take a class with another child, that's a way to kind of bond or have that shared experience. Um, like in a safe and online way. Great, thank you so much. I think that was all the questions. I'll give it one more second um, as we say thank you to you if anything pops into the chat. I know that you've kindly offered to share um, you know, additional resources in your contact information, which we will put in our follow-up email. So thank you again so much for sharing your wisdom and expertise with all of us. This was so helpful and informative and I don't even have school-aged children and I've been, <laughs> I was writing down all the books that I wanna look into. So thank you so much for sharing yeah. after um, donating your time back to Fairfield. And for everyone on the call, thank you for joining us tonight. You can view a list of upcoming events online at fairfield.edu slash alumni events. And we will share this recording with everyone after via email. Thank you so much, Meg. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Have a great night. night.